My name is Dave Treat. I lead Accenture's Metaverse business globally. It, uh, it is something that has emerged over time. So we, I founded our blockchain business back in 2015. Um, a couple years later, we recognized that actually the whole notion of the tokenization of identity, money, and objects as kind of the killer use cases in the blockchain space um, were dying for the experiences layer side of things. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Did. Yep. Um, and so a couple of years later, folded in our, our augmented reality and virtual reality uh, practices. And now, lo and behold, we roll forward a few years later, and we have a word for that. So I'm going to talk through the, the experiences we've had so far. Thanks, Tracy. Um, and, uh, and, and where we're headed. And I'm going to try to, su try to do some more, more show than tell, uh, have some fun, and let's make this interactive. So no need to wait for questions until the end. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about it all the way through. Um, and uh, please feel free, me, feel free to guide me to go faster or slower. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but the natural progression of the digital world that's been, that, uh, that we've been living in, moving from the internet of data and connecting all of our uh, networks, uh, you know, network of data, adding internet of people and the rise of social media, adding the internet of things. And really now what we're adding is the whole notion of place and ownership. Um, we had the honor of having uh, Sir Tim uh, uh, Berners-Lee uh, launch our tech vision uh, 18 months ago, where we set this business in motion. And of course, Sir, Sir Tim's been very articulate about the way the internet has developed. It's been missing this value, value layer and, um, and certainly the, the, um, the whole notion of, of place. Um, so that identity, value, and place construct has been missing is how it's been developing. Um, and that's really what's now being added. And so when we use the word metaverse, which is getting beaten up soundly in the media right now, um, but I would argue against a very narrow definition of virtual worlds and avatars, uh, we're using the word continuum and thinking very expansively about it. Um, and so we're really thinking about it in, if I can get this thing to advance. We're, we're really thinking about it as this, this overlap between the notion of spatial experience that's unlocked by augmented reality and virtual reality, having us break free from the flat plane of class uh, and the notion of that compute and our digital world is something that's only experienced through uh, you know, a laptop, now more and more a cell phone that we carry around, and that why would we have, just at a fundamental level, our digital world, which is so unconstrained, why would we constrain it just to a flat plane of glass? Why wouldn't compute be a spatial experience that's overlaid on the world around us or enable us to go any place in the world? Combined then with, as I said, uh, those killer use cases from a blockchain perspective of uh, the whole notion of the tokenization of identity, money, and objects. In a ve very similar manner, the whole notion of why is it that in the digital world we would be constrained to, when we want to have service from a service provider, a retailer, authority, uh, we have to onboard ourselves to them give them all of our information. They hold it, sell it, resell it. You know, when in the physical world, you know, that's all very natural and comfortable that I use this wallet to carry around, you know, my, you know, aspects of my identity, my financial credit worthiness. We actually use a separate device to carry around my central bank liabilities. Um, but that whole notion of we don't have that in the digital world. We've been constrained to this construct of in, or in order to get service, we have to give all of our data away. And so this notion of being able to use the power of combining these two things to create a whole new, really unconstrained set of experiences that don't lock us into the flat plane of glass, that enable us to bring our identity, money, and objects with us from place to place to place, and that this is really breaking long-held orthodoxies. When I was a kid growing up, if I wanted to speak with someone who was not within shouting distance, I had to go to the corded wall on the phone in my kitchen and then get yelled at my parents for the length of the phone call because it was very expensive. <laughs> it was, you know, moments later or fast forward till now, any one of us can call anyone anywhere anytime at almost zero marginal additional cost. When I wanted to get money and I, when, I was, you know, when I was a kid, I had to go to a bank teller. I had to have cash pushed across a sill or, you know, early days of ATMs. I had to go to a place to get money. Now, of course, you know, through a variety of whether, you, you know, central bank digital currencies that are on their way or current stablecoin constructs or, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency space, my ability to pay or exchange money with any one of you anywhere, anytime, you know, in any place at any distance, fully enabled. 
So the steady progression of technology, one way to think about it is we've been breaking down these points of friction and, and, and barrier steadily to give us anything we want, anywhere, with anyone, anytime. We can go any place right now through headsets and platforms or looking through our phones. We could bring others to us here and we could interact and collaborate. And so you know, when you take that mindset of the suite of technologies that create that capability, really that's what we're calling metaverse. And the, you know, the amazing journey that's ahead of us to be able to capitalize on all of that new capability and all of the complexity of how to do it in a way that's safe and responsible, and I caught the last few minutes of the previous panel, um, you know, real questions around how to do it right. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll jump straight to the punchline at the end of this, right? It will require us gathering as communities to be able to really identify what is that foundation layer that should be open source, that should be based on common standards where we can align the, the valuable use of this technology to our community values whatever size of that, you know, local or large or global, whatever defines that community. So like I said, I wanna do more show than tell. Um, I will get there faster. Um, market opportunities, staggering. Actually, when you look at the, you know, a, a kind of at it from multiple different facets, uh, right now we've just tracked, um, and a lot through our own client base, more than 50% of the global Fortune 100 are engaged in aspects of this continuum of experiences. Uh, the, you know, if you take the whole NFT space, the whole notion of the tokenization of objects, I'll talk about that in more depth and so what's, you know, where the real focus is, but there's real money being spent on this notion of, of a digital object that we bring with us ideally from place to place to place. Um, transactions, you know, purchasing my single largest spend uh, on my two teenage boys last holiday season, and I know again will be this holiday season, is they want money to buy skins on Fortnite. They want money to buy things in their gaming world. It is second nature to the next generation that digital only objects have utility value and they and and you know and, and they're willing to buy and pay for them um it may you know it may feel silly for you know to me they feel it <laughs> it's very important to them uh so the next generation is coming up with all of this just being natural uh there is some eye-watering figures that are out there and these are actually some of the lower end of that eye-watering eye figures um you know, cities, cities number is that when you think about this continuum of metaverse capabilities, it's a $13 trillion economy by 2030. Um, that is a staggering pace at which this is all going to advance uh, over the coming years, if that were to play out. Even at the low end, the, the 800 billion, I think is Gartner's number, right? Doesn't matter if we're, if we're off by order of magnitude. It is clearly a big space, notwithstanding the media beat up <laughs> Over the, over the, in the trough of disillusionment we're in right now against this very narrow definition. Um, so we want to expand that definition um, and we want to uh, really help people understand how pervasive the impact is going to be. And so um, I'm going to do this fast and get into some actual examples, but from a customer experience perspective, the whole notion of immersive experiences to change the, na the nature of how businesses relate to their customers, um, I will show you an example of it that we just, uh, just launched in Singapore uh, in a retail shopping mall, but that whole notion of immersive try-on, um, immersive does it fit in my room, um, that whole notion of will, you know, will the couch fit in the living room, those you know, things that we're now seeing more and more commonplace. The, the value pool there is there's, uh, just for, as an example, the retail industry, if you can materially reduce the return rates, which the early data proves that you really can, if I am able to try it on something as close as possible to my actual body, I'm more likely only to buy it because I really wanted it. I only will buy it because it has a good chance of fitting. It's the color I wanted. If I can reduce the return rate, the average uh, cost of a good to be returned is 50 bucks. It's a real value pool to the retail industry. They're fired up about it. And so you're seeing a lot of engagement from the big fashion houses and the like around what is an immersive shopping, um, what will it drive? From a product perspective, every product company on the planet that we're, you know, that's our client, we're in a conversation with to say, do you, does your product have a valid heads up display that would extend the utility or service or love or you know, the purchase of the next version of your product. 
We're all used to the heads-up display in our car. It tells us to go faster, slower, left, right. The whole notion of a heads-up display has been around for a very long time. But even if it's experienced through a cell phone, that ability to, to have that overlay of that heads-up display, even experienced through, through seeing, uh, seeing objects through a cell phone, and then as we move towards wearables, that notion of every product company needing to think through what is that valid, useful, valuable heads-up display is key. And then the whole notion, I really regret doing this on my iPad. Um, <laughs> and then the whole notion of uh, digitally native products. Um, obviously, you know, per my example on the previous slide, the amount of money that's going into uh, NFTs and digital objects, um, again, it's a real thing. And there's some really valid digitally native products, and there's some really spectacularly bad ones. <laughs> so the whole notion of um, conversation with a beauty company that we're working with, and there was an early notion of, well, let's create a digital twin of lipstick. Well, digital twin of lipstick is not interesting. Right? That is a, what, what would you actually do with that? It's, it has no actual utility. However, what that company actually sells is beauty. And how we show up in a metaverse location in a VR experience, we, you know, to a person that we take into our metaverse places, there is a comment or an, or an insight around, oh, you chose that outfit, or I chose this. Like We all are used to getting up every day and putting on the outfit that matches the course of our day, who we're going to be with, the weather, et cetera. That whole notion of how we show up will translate exactly into the digital world. That beauty company can sell the visage for your avatar. That matches me better. You've captured who I am. Um, you know, that whole notion of selling beauty, not selling the digital twin of the lipstick is a serious thing. That then comes with it of how do you make these products? A digital object, uh, as, you know, if when done right, let's not say if, when done right, needs to move with me from digital place to place to place and experience. We need the standards for that. We need the, the infrastructure and the platforms that have that portability, that interoperability to be able to enable that. That's a different supply chain. That's a different custody structure. How do you prove ownership? How do you transfer ownership? How do you be able to, how can you manage the intellectual property rights of, of the usage of it? Uh, and you know, we're seeing that early, very awkward, clunky version of it in the NFT space, you know, where companies are doing things like I'm gonna make 10 sneakers and, and, and go down the route of uh, the, you know, the, the scarcity valuation model grab a headline, do something that actually, if they were to step back and when they're stepping back to think about it, actually what they want is their brand showing up everywhere and everyone engaging with the brand. And so making a fungible version of the sneaker, producing it at hundreds of millions of, co of copies, having it show up on all of the, all of our feet, you know, for the avatars uh, that we, you know, where that's enabled, um, having their brand everywhere and being able to prove that it's authentic is the valuable part of that tokenization, not the scarcity of value. Payments infrastructure is being modernized and overhauled. That is a whole separate talk. I, will not, I won't go into that. Uh, from an employee experience perspective, um, we are our own best credential in this space. We've built uh, our own metaverse places for employee onboarding. We are 725,000 people right now. Um, we've onboarded 180,000 people now through our metaverse-based experiences, our before and after measurement of the uh, engagement, the learning, the retention of knowledge, the networking, and the relationship building has been staggering, right? Um, and so we are, we are our, our, our global uh, HR lead, fully committed. This is the only way we do onboarding now as a global organization to be able to drive that consistency and that networking. Uh, and so whether it, it, we did, designed it in a way that can be experienced valuably in two dimensions or three, headset or not, um, and we're getting great data around it. So the whole notion of the employee experience, we're just at the beginning of that. And again, I think I'm, I'll show you a couple examples. And then the last one I'll say is, um, you know, building upon the, the multi-decade really productive use of digital twins in an industrial setting. So the industrial digital twin of an operation or manufacturing plant, tremendously val valid and useful. Now making that collaborative and immersive, massively powerful. And I'll show you an example. Um, so I've already done more tell than I meant to. <laughs> Let's show some videos. Um, so this is, uh, if I can get it to play. Uh oh. Oh no. All right, we'll see if this plays in a second. It might be loading. All right, I guess we're skipping the volumetric capture. I'll come back to that with my phone. Um, so this is a video of something uh, that we just did with Lendlease uh, in Singapore uh, for Chinese New Year. This was, uh, it's Year of the Rabbit. 
Uh, so what, what, the, what you're seeing here is an activation in the mall where Lens Lease went to 50 of their tenants and said, we're going to run this activation in the mall. We're going to ask uh, you know, uh, those in the mall to basically scan a QR code, download an app, and then search for these, uh, these augmented reality based bunnies and tickets and offers in the mall. So think this is the next generation of Pokemon Go, uh, but now tied directly to retail, tied directly to commerce. Um, some tremendous results. It was wildly popular. Uh, actually drove a change in foot traffic, chose, yeah, drove uh, engagement with the brands, uh, drove additional sales, um, was wildly powerful. Um, I'm not able to show, but can loosely reference. We just did this for one of the big theme parks for their super fans. Same, same result. The whole notion of a brand using tokenization and an augmented reality experience overlaid on the physical environment to change behaviors, drive engagement, drive additional commerce, um, wildly powerful, and we're just at the beginning of it. That notion of then being able to carry one's identity from brand to brand to brand and experience to experience to experience, core to how this plays out, you know, and rather dystopian if it stays in its current siloed infrastructure. So again, another huge topic for this community around our whole patterns and focus of, uh, of um, digital identity. I'd love to go back one. Let me try to see if I can get this video to run. Um, volumetric video. Oh, I may seriously regret this. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Um, all right, it's loading. Let's see if this loads. Um, we have, uh, we have a whole set of volumetric video capture rigs. Um, we did a, an experience with the NFL where we took uh, Kalecha Usumele from the Boston Ravens. A fan won the chance to actually plant, uh, actually maybe I'll switch to my phone. Let me do that. Um, a chance to actually, oh, did it go? This is, I'll come back to that one. This is, uh, All right, I'm going to let that load here, and I'm going to switch to my phone. All right, so this is not Kaleche, <laughs> but this is me. So this is a this is a one minute volumetric video recording of me um, that you know you saw. It took me a second to pull up, um, you know, and now let's just plant me. Where did I plant myself? I plant myself here. I can't turn the volume up loud enough, but I contemplated having, my, having this, this version of me you know, do the opening of this talk instead of me. Um, but you can see, you know, this is a, you know, you know, this is a high fidelity volumetric video capture. Um, my ability to place me anywhere, you know, transpose that in your mind to I'm standing in the DIY shop. And, you know, I'm standing in Home Depot or Lowe's. I'm contemplating whether I have the skills to actually, um, sorry, I have to get myself to shut up here. Stop. Um, you know, I'm contemplating whether or not I actually want to buy that power tool or not. Uh, do I have the skills to use it? I scan a QR code, standing in that aisle, and Bob Vila pops up and says, you can do it. <laughs> Here's exactly how it works, right? And I get the thing home, and I can't find, uh, you know, where to change the, uh, change the oil on the generator I bought. Uh, I can't find the plug, and I scan a code on the side of the, of the generator, and, you know, Bob, Bob says, no, no, it's, it's right here. <laughs> And you know that ability to have that overlay of high quality information on our physical world um, again links together not just the augmented reality um, aspect of it, but the, the 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 relationship of me with the brand, the the you know personalization, the customization. Um, the thing about Kaleche, if I could get it to show, I'll, I'll have you imagine it. Um, <laughs> Just like I planted myself there, and, and um, Kaleche was able to see through the phone uh, and have a, a live conversation with the fan. So the fan was able to plant him in that fidelity, so he's just like he was standing in his living room, and have a two-way conversation. The whole notion of volumetric video customer support is maybe a high-end, really high-touch, high-innovation, high-tech way that customer service may get evolved. Take a hotel chain. Staffing the front desk is a relatively pricey proposition. It's very, very lumpy as to when they actually have to do real work during a day, during check-in and check-out times. Expensive to staff. Um, we, for years, could have just made that a, an iPad 
not like this, but an, iPad, an effective iPad and a video conversation. But that's not really a high touch, good customer service dynamic. But what if it was like I just dropped myself in a live two-way interaction, and now suddenly you could have a high-touch, more human-like interaction in real time, anywhere, any place. So you know, all of these things um, you know, are, are, were just at the first, first implementations of. Um, this is, uh, from a, a virtual reality perspective, um, work we've been doing at the World Economic Forum. Um, I can't show the video, uh, so we're not, um, not allowed to yet, but just as an image, um, we've created a campus for Professor Schwab and the World Economic Forum to be able to host dialogue between global stakeholders around key topics. Um, and we, did the, we showed this in January. We had the first multilateral session where the power of being able to have the conversation within the context of the content was actually quite useful. The utility of what you can do in these environments is going to improve over time. So, um, you know, forget whiteboards and sticky notes. Being able to be with a group of people immersed in data and interacting with that data in a ver fully customizable virtual place, um, wildly powerful. The other way that this is wildly powerful um, is for training simulations. So one of the things we've done uh, for a government setting is be able to take a hyper-realistic, not you know, not animated, but hyper-realistic environment for social worker training. So being able to do something you actually can't do in the physical world of put a social worker into a setting where there is violence, guns, drugs, child abuse, just to, to think of the worst possible setting within which to run a training simulation, being able to do that in a fully virtual space because you can do it again and again and again, and you can practice and get feedback and you can rerun the same scenarios, something you couldn't even possibly do with actors in the real world and something that paper and you know, flat interactions have never been really great for. Um, so there's a, you know, horses for courses between virtual reality and augmented reality, and then, and then you know, the, the constructs of how our identity, money, and objects stream through it, um, all super important conversations about how this plays out. Come on. Okay, I broke in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let me see if I can do one more. All right, that's not coming back. Um, I was going to show uh, an integration that we just did with NVIDIA um, and Microsoft Teams. So NVIDIA has developed their Omniverse platform that um, is the most high fidelity, most heavyweight um, virtual reality platform you know, that's out there. It has a physics engine built into it. That, you know, that allows you to be able to define the physical characteristics of the objects in the virtual environment so that you can model and do the scenario analysis of um, if you dropped it, would it break or bounce? If you, if you pushed it, would it bend or not? How will light reflect off of it? Um, and part of what we showed, I'm going to try to have to restart this. Um, part of what we uh, demonstrated was the global collaboration capability within that by integrating it with Teams live sharing. So we were able to demonstrate how um, you could get multiple people together, all working off of different tool sets um, within the Omniverse platform uh, to design an environment. Um, we're starting to do this for our own offices. Excellent, I'll get Emma to help me here. Nope. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna quit trying. Um, so uh, so that demo just showed that you know the the power of being able to have uh, you know gl global collaboration between multiple parties on multiple platforms uh, to be able to actually work and change uh, a physical environments in in a you know tremendous high fidelity. So we think about the world um, between the whole notion of as you, I think you've seen a, you know a set of customer experiences 
of uh, enterprise experiences and industrial experiences, the range of this changes the nature between a brand and a customer, it changes the nature of the products that, uh, that, we, that we buy and interact with, it changes the nature of how we run our enterprises, how we collaborate and work. This, the pervasive change that this, con that this continuum of capabilities will drive is just staggering. Um, to that end, you know, the end of the presentation was um, really about the responsible aspect of how we do that and the effectiveness and a bit of a call to action and why this community is so important in that in order to do this right, this can't be, you know, a individually siloed set of experiences that almost all metaverse places are today um, in a virtual reality perspective and really in an augmented reality perspective and the power of, if we can get it right, being able to port and bring with, bring with us our identity, money, and objects from place to place to place, all against which then the, the, the values that we have as a community need to be defined around behaviors and safety and inclusion um, and, uh, and, you know, and then the obvious around security and IP rights and the like. And so um, we have a huge focus on this. Um, it's part of why we participate in the, in the you know, suite of Linux projects involved uh, in helping to drive parts of this as well as other global communities. Um, so just open call to um, you know, all of us work together to be able to think through you know, what, what, do we, what could we do better and get right about now that in a similar manner we would have done if we convened before the rise of the social media phase and how maybe how it would have played out differently had we had enough dialogue. So I uh, was hoping to show you in a more elegant fashion <laughs> the, uh, the, the range of things that are, uh, that are currently underway um, and, and, and inspire to say, look, this is deeply powerful and, and to try to invoke those conversations. So let's make this interactive now. Nobody interrupted me, which I'm, is regrettable. So what questions, uh, what questions or topics could we explore together for the next 10 minutes? Please. Yeah. So the question was for those for the for those for those participating remotely. The question was, did we um, did we did we buy headsets? Um, we did. We bought sixty thousand. Um, so we bought sixty thousand headsets. We're continuing. We're we're now contemplating the next waves of purchase, and we're anticipating. Um, there's a bit of a complexity here. Of you know that was obviously pricey. <laughs> Um, but we thought valuable. We learned a ton from it. We had this incredible proliferation of, uh, of, of people. We opened up the, the, the platform that we were using to let people build their own spaces, and they just, there was a Cambrian explosion of, of you know, creativity that happened. So that was wonderful. Um, but it is, an interesting con it is an interesting concept to say, if you view the headsets as an incremental cost, and at the price point that they're selling right now to have the, one, you know, to have the good ones, it's, it, that, that's pricey. Until we get to the first, you know, second, second, third generation of them, when it's a choice of how much work can you do in headset and does the headset replace the laptop, I think you then get into a totally different mindset around it. And I do think that's largely where we're headed. So that's very dystopian for some folks who haven't been com comfortable in the headsets yet. Um, for me, I put these on every morning when I wake up and I don't take them off until I go to bed. Um, the faster we progress towards something that is just this comfortable, um, you know, and integrated to wear, the thought of me not having to wrestle with, you know, this is the easy one, absence these challenges, right? I've got a brick of a laptop that I lug around. If compute can really be anywhere and the headset, the, the future wearable replaces the laptop, it's actually, you know, a pretty good capital cost trade. But yes, we bought 60,000 headsets and we made sure that it worked in a lovable way in two dimensions as well. Okay. Um, so you're, th this is interesting and in informative, but you're here presenting at, at the Linux Foundation Summit, right? Where do you specifically see open source pl playing a role for you? What, why are you here at this summit? You know, it's a great question, and um, again, regrettable that I had so much trouble with the slides. But um, so, uh, so I was one of the founding board members of Hyperledger, and continue to sit on that board. I also am now a founding board member of the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, we participate in, you know, in um, Trust Over IP. Uh, you know, we have participated in DIFF and Finos. You know, if you look at the, if you look at these, the open source foundation and the standards required to unlock and enable 
the way these experiences should go with that portability and you know and and the you know and and avoiding the lock-in of you know the, of the silos that we're stuck in now open source is the answer of being able to build that foundation and and then obviously the the open the standards that go along with it so um, you know as an example so um, literally I've got a team that we dedicate to the Linux open source community Tracy heads it up um, we've now we've now contributed over seven million lines of code to the various hyperledger projects we are particularly focused on interoperability uh, with hyperledger cacti um, uh, DevOps with bevel uh, and now launching the open wallet foundation aspect uh, you know um, set of projects in particular to help drive that whole fundamental building block set of engines for really good wallet infrastructure that underpins it all Anyone else feeling feeling slightly down about the beat up that Metaverse as a term is taking right now? <laughs> did the did the definition help a little bit? The you know we we're, the, we're we're searching for language when when we're in client conversations and we explain and we say, look, this is about you know not just not just VR, you know that AR is important and it's you know and the identity, money, and object side, it immediately resonates and it immediately depressurizes it. Um, but we're sensitive to, you know, it's a it's a tough go in the media at the moment. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, um, I guess for me, the thing that struck stuck out about what you shared was the experience in the mall, which didn't give me warm fuzzies. I was like, uh oh. Like we're having enough, we're having serious problems today with how young people in particular are engaging with social media. If you look at Jonathan Haidt's research, like we have a whole social conversation to have about that and fixing it because young people are showing up in college with no basic skills about how to navigate the world as like semi-adults and they're not having sex with each other. Like, there's some weird stuff happening that is as a result of social media that social science researchers are tracking. That just makes me go like, oh, like, what are we gonna do with that stuff that's messed up? It could also be really cool. Like, I'm looking at it also being like, okay, could we also train the AI things to help us know the plants in our ecosystems and help us watch the, like, it could be good, but if we're only driving consumer value at the mall, I get really freaked out. I do, I do too, and hence, you know, the, the, uh, we have a team just dedicated to the responsible aspects of it. I guess part of what gives me hope, in, and particularly in this community, is that if it's left to individual commercial you know thinking and innovation then yes i think we'll end up with a lot of a lot of noise and and you know and ink and and you know and i think many of the dangers you're highlighting will proliferate um if it, it will be difficult for it to play out that way though because at scale the whole notion of a wallet per thing an app per thing a, you know, the, you know if, they, if, if we have that Cambrian explosion of stuff that maybe we get frustrated with, the power of being able to have an open source basis for wallet infrastructure where you can start to encode within it those community values and policies and, and capabilities and be able to, as a parent, right now, my ability to, you know, for, with my three, three teenage kids, you know, figure out the settings between Snapchat, Instagram, you know, Signal, you know, WhatsApp, like the, I, it is untenable for me to be able to be an effective parent because I've got to think about it app by app, context by context. If we actually created a construct where this, you know, there was not one wallet to rule them all, that would be bad. But if we had a open source foundation for the wallet infrastructure that could be encoded with a set of policies and rules and guide the nature of how could our kids or ourselves, you know, 
responsibly apply and be a, responsibly interacted with and provided services from others because in order to use your identity money and objects, you have to, it will happen through that wallet infrastructure. That gives me hope that that consolidation from a tech perspective gives us a place to have those conversations and to encode those values. But if we don't, if we don't get that going, it will be individual commercial interest because that this is the manifest, you know, this, this is, this is the cookie wars have led us to, you got to find a new way. <laughs> um, and we have to make sure that that new way is responsible. Please. In one way or another, yes. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think about that one. Yeah, um, the we we do. Yeah, um, sorry, you're you're tapping into a, a perpetual frustration I have of you know we just can't, it's hard hard to keep a website up to date. But yes, we you know the, a lot of this content is already on it, and and um, it's a good kick for me to make sure that uh, we get we get more of it out there. So yes, with um, we'll th think of a way to do that. Excellent. Well, thanks for your time. Um, happy to continue conversations in the hallway and. <laughs>